So the question here is, what are the current advancement techniques on predictive modeling in PLS SEM? So, Professor Christian or Professor Marco, either one of you could start first because this session is all yours. We focus on um, the prediction part. And yeah, I would start uh, simply picking up um, what Marco uh, just explained. And um, uh, one of the biggest advanc advancements certainly is uh, the predictive orientation of PLS SEM. And um, when we look into the method, uh, and if you go back to Hermann Wold and, um, and uh, Karl Joroskog, his doctoral student who developed um, CBSEM, and if you take a look at uh, their joint paper and when they compare CBSEM and PLSSEM as, as rather complementary methods, one key element um, that plays out is um, that you should use uh, PLSSEM when you have predictive goals and uh, a prediction orientation of your research, and um, that's how it all evolved. But at some point, um, when you look at the evaluation criteria, you find that um, PLSSEM did not uh, nicely um, develop um, in these regards uh, throughout the years. And um, up to a certain point, we had a simple method, namely blindfolding, that was uh, sitting there since the 1980s, and which already had been transferred by Herm Hermann Wold to the PLS SEM uh, methodology to um, do a predictive assessment of results. And since then, we had the blindfolding procedure, and we could obtain uh, the Q square value out of it, and we um, introduced this criterion, actually that's what Win Chin in his uh, famous 1990, 1998 handbook article already did, we introduced uh, this Q square value um, to the standard set of PLS SEM evaluation criteria. But um, there's an issue. It's not an out of sample um, predict predictive um, uh, power assessment criterion. And um, there was the famous PLS SEM conference in Sevilla, and at this conference, um, Galic Mueli was around, and Galic Mueli is an excellent researcher, especially when it comes uh, to predictive research. And um, there was a very nice discussion about this issue, and she said, well, uh, that's not a problem at all. It's um, clear that one could develop an out-of-sample predictive assessment criterion for PLS SEM, and that's what she did in her JBR article that was connected uh, to the PLS SEM conference in Sevilla, the um, 2016 um, JBR article, where she introduced PLS Predict as a new um, uh, criterion for predictive assessment, which we right away implemented into um, the Smart PLS software. I think that's um, the point to hand over to Marco, where um, the journey continued from PLS Predict Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we were really um, thrilled by this uh, new procedure because um, it basically overcomes something or an issue that we have not really identified that clearly uh, before. I mean, we were aware that the Q square is not a perfect metric, um, but yet uh, we were unsure how to uh, implement something related to prediction into PLS. And fortunately, uh, Gallet and her team uh, took care of that. And um, so here's how PLS predict actually works. Um, so what this procedure does, it takes the data set and then uh, splits it into a, a so-called training sample and a test sample. So the training sample is actually that part of the sample that's going to be used for the model estimation. So you, using that, PLS generates uh, estimates for the path coefficients, for the loadings, for the weights, and all these things that are of relevance. Um, the test sample is not considered, so it's actually taken out. So in the next step, what uh, PLS predictor does, it, it takes these estimates, combines them with the values of the indicators of, let's say, the predictor constructs, the exogenous constructs indicators, and generates predictions for the indicators of the dependent constructs, for the endogenous constructs. So again, yeah, using the estimates from the training sample, combine it with the indicator data from the test sample, and then generate predictions for the dependent construct indicators. 
So the cool thing is we actually know what the dependent construct indicator values are. They were held out of the sample of the um, of the main sample used for the model testing, but we know the true values. So what we can do now is we can simply contrast the predicted and the actual values. And well, if they are the same, then well, that's perfect prediction. And if they are divergent, well, then we have to judge, okay, how divergent are they? And this is what we refer to as the prediction error, just the, the means to express, okay, how far off are our predictions from the true values. The different ways how we can um, quantify these prediction errors, and you might have uh, seen these metrics like the RMSE or the MAE, these are different types of metrics that we can use. And I would just simply suggest you look into the um, uh, the guidelines article and also the original article from uh, from Gallit, which we haven't put in here, but it's like uh, prominently cited in our European Journal of Marketing article, the 2016 JBR peaks. Yeah? And so there are different types of metrics that you can rely on depending on whether the errors are distributed like symmetrically. So you look at the distribution of the errors and it's like a nice bell-shaped curve, or whether it's kind of skewed to the left or to the right and some metric uh, works better. Uh, than the other, but generally what we do uh, is we call for using uh, the RMSE. Yeah? So this is kind of the uh, standard metric that it has been used in predictive modeling. So the thing with the RMSE is it's um, <clears throat> uh, nice because it kind of penalizes um, errors that are very large, so larger errors get even larger because of this. Yeah, So this is a good thing actually in most applications, but it's not kind of scale like the R square. So you can't say an RMSE of one is great or is bad or whatever. The only thing you can say is an RMSE of zero is fantastic, yeah? But it's not gonna happen, yeah? Because the RMSE uh, depends on the scaling of your original variable. So it depends on whether your indicators are measured on a, say, seven point Likert scale or on a scale from zero to 100. So what you need is actually some type of standard of comparison. And basically implements it in, in Smart PLS, and there's just two ways of doing it, are um, two metrics, the Q square, you know, Q square predict, and the LM, the linear model. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, simply because of time requirements, but the Q square is kind of the, the most naive benchmark that you can assume. Yeah, it's basically, you're saying the naive prediction that there is, and the LM model is also some type of benchmark that we specify. It's also pretty naive, but it's not as bad as the Q-square. So what you're actually doing is you compare these LM values with the RMSE values for all your indicators, and you're checking, okay, are the prediction errors predict, uh, generated by PLS, yeah, in the form of the RMSE values, larger or smaller than the LM values? The LM values are a simple linear model. Again, not going to go into too much uh, detail here. And depending on whether the indicators have higher or lower prediction errors in PLS, we would grant the model like a strong or medium or low predictive power, or sometimes even no predictive power at all, which would be kind of a problem in my uh, perspective. So importantly, and that's something for those of you that have already worked with PLS predict, um, we focus on one single construct. So we don't consider all endogenous constructs that are in the entire set we look into one specific construct, maybe two. Yeah? So the key focal constructs of our model, yeah? those that we are actually interested in, they could be, for example, I don't know, turnover, or could be the overall satisfaction, or could be the brand image, you name it, depending on what you're actually interested in to predict in your model. Okay, so PLS predict um, has gained pretty much momentum, and we believe it should be part of every type of analysis. Um, however, in some settings, we're not only interested in looking into predictive power of one specific model, we might be interested in comparing different models. And this is something that we have really uh, worked strongly in uh, in the last uh, one or two years, so-called model comparisons. So in a model comparison, what, what happens here is that your theory may suggest different types of models. And I mean, let's be honest, yeah, that's typically the case. Yeah? So there's not just one model that explains your reality or the mechanisms that you're interested in well, but there are multiple models that could work well. But 
then you estimate these different models and you ask yourself, okay, which is the better model? Yeah, and bad idea would be to make that decision based on metrics like the R square, because the R square will always increase with model complexity. So having more complex models will automatically increase the R square. Also looking at pass coefficient significance is not a good idea because this is not really indicative of whether one model is better or the other. Fortunately, there have been metrics out there that allow us to compare different models and you might actually be aware of them. You've seen them maybe in outputs uh, such as in Stata or in R or even in SPSS you get these. These are called information criteria or model selection criteria. It depends on uh, which metrics are used here. And um, these uh, criteria, they engage in a trade-off. So what they do is, on the one hand, they say, okay, a large model produces a better fit, what, whatever that fit is now. Yeah? In our case, it's simply looking at the R-square development. Yeah? So you, we want to have a, a model with a high R-square that's good like that fit. Yeah? But at the same time, we want to have a parsimonious model, meaning a model that is not overly complex. So that's a principle in, in science. Yeah? Um, the model should be complex enough to explain reality, but it should not be too complex because if the model is too complex, it does not generalize well to other settings. Yeah? So you take that one model, it might well, work well in your setting, but then some other researcher uses it or some practitioner uses it in a different context, meaning a different industry, different company, different time, different country, you name it, yeah? then suddenly the word model stops working well. So that's why we want to have small models, parsimony. And there's a trade-off. Yeah? On the one hand, you want to have a small model, but on the other hand, we want to have a big model because it should fit well. You know? And these criteria quantify this trade-off. You know? So they, on the one hand, they acknowledge that a larger model generates better fit, but they, at the same time, they penalize this model complexity by some factor. And uh, these criteria actually uh, work well in PLS2. Yeah, and we have uh, looked into their performance in this um, uh, in our uh, papers in Journal of the Association of Information Systems and also in Decision Sciences, which you can see here. Um, one particularly interesting fact about these criteria is that they actually not only look into fits, like in an R square sense, yeah, but also they engage in prediction orientation. That's a bit odd because there's nothing happening like you would know from PLS predict taking like sample out, training, test sample. That's actually not happening. It's only one metric. But they are scaled in such a way that they actually not only also try to maximize predictive power. And we looked into the uh, performance of these metrics and checked, okay, are they actually able to find a sound balance between model fit, parsimony, and predictive power. And we found out that there's a set of criteria that works really well in these two respects. So they actually um, find a sound trade-off between having a small model and which should fit well and also predicts pretty well. And these metrics uh, are called BIC and GM, so Bayesian Information Criterion and Wicke Mies Criterion. So how do you use them? Well, basically you just test your different models, you write down the BIC and GM values, and you simply compare the BIC and GM values across the different models. And you would pick the model which minimizes a certain BIC value. Let's say you have two models, one generates a BIC value of 100, the other one of 90, you would pick the model which has the 90 in the BIC. It's pretty simple. So Smart PLS has these, um, um, these criteria included, also R packages, like um, seminar. But you can actually take that one step further, only focus that prediction. And I think that's something that I'd pass on to, to Christian. Thank you. And uh, that's, a, that's a good point um, also to demonstrate how research uh, evolves. And uh, based on this point, um, when Marco introduced um, uh, these criteria for the model selection, we wanted to get um, one step further, and uh, that's when Jackie now flips the slides. Next. Yeah. Yes, and uh, we looked into a project uh, where we developed um, the so-called CVPET. Um, the CVPET um, is a new criterion which we recently published in the Decision Sciences Journal, and 
it's a statistical test um, where you can use a proposed model against an alternative model. And it's uh, the same situation that Marco just described. You often run into a situation where it's not the crystal clear and 100% um, uh, um, model that you would like to take a look at. And you have different options of uh, setting up uh, something uh, conceptually. And then um, when it comes to the empirical substantiation, you may want to take a look at the one alternative versus the other. Or to make it more <laughs> um, uh, applied in your situation, a reviewer calls up and says, well, why is, there, why is there a relationship from A to B in your model? And why isn't the relationship from B to A? And that is um, to make it more uh, practical. Most of you know um, the famous uh, corporate reputation model example. And in the corporate reputation model example, we have um, the relationship from corporate reputation or from the corporate reputation dimensions to customer satisfaction. And now um, you could receive a review or call and saying, well, that sounds plausible, but why isn't it the other way around? Why doesn't lead customer satisfaction to um, uh, corporate reputation? And then you certainly come up with um, all the explanations um, that you provide on the theoretical and conceptual ground based on the prior literature which you checked and make your argument. But your argument becomes much stronger when you on top can substantiate um, your findings on empirical grounds and you test um, the predictive power of the one model against the other. And that's what CVPET would do you would say, well, my original model, my proposed model is with a corporate reputation on customer satisfaction. And the alternative model is where customer satisfaction is related uh, to the corporate reputation I mentioned. And then you would like to see which one has the higher predictive power and is it significant? And that's what uh, CVPET does. What we do in this article is um, we develop um, the statistical test. The statistical test um, includes certainly um, an out-of-sample prediction by looking at um, what the model is capable to predict in the indicators and uses um, these um, residual values, averages them and creates a type of t-statistic. So um, the two co contributions were first to develop this test, um, which results in a T-statistic, and to secondly, um, uh, secondly show that this um, kind of um, T-statistic generally holds and um, meets um, the underlying statistical assumptions to run it, um, to turn it into a P-value, which we then can simply use um, for the assess assessment. That sounds um, yeah, uh, relatively simple, but it took um, certain simulation studies and a lot of tests um, to do this. And uh, on these um, methodological and uh, simulation grounds, we went further and um, uh, showed how to apply this criterion. And um, in the outcome, and uh, that's the R code, which we also provide with this article, you simply define your proposed model, you simply define your alternative model, and then you run the test, uh, one model against the other, and you would like to see that um, the uh, statistical test uh, usually is in favor for your proposed model. If it's not, well, that's not an issue. I mean, uh, that gives you something to think and um, allows you to go back uh, to the grounds of your research and to think, okay, is there an issue in my theory? Is there an issue in my data? Or is there some specifics uh, to the kind of analysis um, which I did? But um, it definitely is um, a nice addition uh, to the toolbox of predictive model assessment in the PLS-SEM context. And to basically summarize it, um, coming from the out-of-sample assessment of predictive quality using R-square values and F-square effect sizes, which you always should report, we had uh, the blindfolding Q-square value in our toolbox. Well, um, after the introduction of PLS-predict, um, which Marco just uh, explained, we now have uh, two more criteria. That's first, um, the Q-square predict, and secondly, the comparison of, um, the, um, of the PLS model against the linear model. Coming to the Q-square PLS predict uh, um, value, there's some confusion. Which one should I use? The blindfolding Q-square, the traditional one, 
or the Q-square predict value. We recommend using the Q-square predict value. Of course, it's a nice out-of-sample um, prediction and um, basically benchmarks um, your model against uh, the average value of um, the um, of the data set um, and uh, therefore it's uh, just a naive um, first criterion. But um, it doesn't harm to do the blindfolding uh, PLS uh, um, Q-square value on top. So if um, you're confused with the two Q-square values, um, always use um, the Q-square PLS predict, but um, on top you certainly can still use the blindfolding one, but um, you should uh, uh, primarily rely on the Q-square predict one. And then secondly, on these grounds, um, if the Q-square predict um, is uh, above zero, you go into the comparison of um, the, the RMSE values of um, the PLS results and the linear model. And you would like to show that uh, for the relevant indicators in your target construct, um, the uh, PLS SEM results show a lower uh, root mean squared error than the linear model results. And thereby you substantiate the predictive quality of your model. So that is the groundwork. And on top, um, if you like to compare a proposed model against an alternative model, you can start um, with the information criterion um, comparison. You use um, the DIC and uh, the GM criterion, as Marco explained, and which are already implemented in uh, the seminar R package or the Smart Pillar software application. And um, if you would like um, to statistically test that um, the one model has a significantly higher um, predictive power than the other, then you would run CVPET, the latest, ed latest addition um, to the predictive toolbox in PLS SEM. And um, yeah, definitely um, uh, the journey is not finished. Um, we are working on the one or the other project uh, to further um, extend um, the capabilities of the PLS SEM method for predictive analysis and assessment. And, um, but these um, latest additions definitely strengthen the portfolio uh, that you now have in hands uh, for your analysis and assessment. Super, super insights. Guess that more to learn this prediction topic. Uh, more research also needed, that definitely. So next. Finally, let us look into the last topic for today. That is the future development and the use of PLS SCM. So let us start with Professor Christian. Since you are the co-founder of the Smart PLS software, or should I say Smart PLS software is your baby, how would you see the use of PLS SCM in the next 12 months? What would, your, what would be your plan accordingly? Next. The floor is yours, Christian. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there are big plans and uh, what I do here is I just give you an exclusive preview on Smart PLS 4. So you're the first to see um, the interface of the Smart PLS 4 software application. And that is something um, that certainly happens um, all over um, the time. Technology advances, and with the advancement um, of technology, everything that you uh, have under the hood, um, the um, engine, the transmission, and whatsoever, it advances, it changes, and um, you need to keep up to date um, with the technolo technological developments to ensure that the software is running in 10 years um, and still runs. And um, that means about every five years, you need to completely re-engineer um, the technological underpinnings of the software application, which is basically like a complete new software development. And that's um, what we started a while ago to make Smart PLS uh, fit for the technological future. So we are working on the engine, we are working on the transmission and um, these things under the hood. But um, at the same time, um, uh, the technological advances also give you new opportunities um, to improve or uh, to make the user interface uh, more user friendly. And that's what we are working on. And um, one of the key outcomes um, that we would like uh, to accomplish uh, with the Smart PLS 4 software application to make it um, even easier to use um, as it is today 
even though we are implementing much more functionality. And that's something you can imagine, also looking at the many different questions in the chat. Can you do this kind of analysis with PLSACM? Can you do that kind of analysis and so on? There's um, the portfolio of um, methods and criteria is always expanding and that adds, adds a lot of complexity to the, um, to the method. And many um, users are already getting confused. How can I deal with the many criteria? How do I um, uh, probably do it? And uh, what we would like to do is um, with this uh, rearranged uh, user interface, top priority um, to keep um, the usability um, on a top level. And secondly, to provide the users um, the guidance they need to step-by-step -step, uh, navigate um, through this rich portfolio of um, uh, opportunities and analysis possibilities and um, thereby to make it still very easy to use even though the complexity is increasing and that's the biggest challenge for us um, to find uh, this kind of balance. And um, our goal for the future is uh, to make uh, Smart PLS4 um, the Swiss knife of graphical modeling analysis and statistics. Of course, um, with the new um, engine and uh, uh, things under the hood, we can certainly expand into certain directions. So not only having a basic uh, or um, all means of PLS SEM analysis, if you just uh, switch the slides. What we also can do in the future is um, we can offer the tools um, that you need to run a simple regression analysis. Um, of course, it's uh, not so difficult to graphically model um, a regression model. And um, then uh, you run the analysis, you get all the results you need. And in the context of regression analysis, uh, the process uh, tool in SPSS is quite popular. You don't need process in PLS SEM. Um, bootstrapping does all the job when you do a moderated um, mediation and so on. Um, that's um, what all can be done uh, based um, on the PLS SEM results. So process is not really needed in the PLS SEM uh, context. But when you run a simple um, regression analysis, um, you certainly would like um, to use um, these related tools as well. And all of this is possible. And uh, we would like to go into this kind of modeling to allow, besides PLS SEM, a simple regression analysis. And uh, we could step by step expand it into nonlinear effects in regression as well, and having moderation and so on. And secondly, um, certainly you can run the confirmatory. Um, factor analysis. That would also be an addition for the future. And uh, next, Jackie, if you go to the next slide. And uh, one uh, thing we are currently working at, of course, um, there were so many requests um, that uh, people are looking for a user-friendly uh, software for doing uh, CBSEM. Of course, the reviewers asked, well, um, I should compare my results to CBSEM results and whatsoever. And um, there was a strong um, uh, request for adding such capabilities. And uh, we simply started this project, even though it's complicated. But um, what we um, now have a good, in a, in a pretty good stage is um, CBS modeling capabilities, um, including the possibility to import SPSS data. You can also import Excel data in the future, that's no problem. And uh, you can import entire AMOS models if you like to. And uh, if you simply like to run um, a CBSEM analysis to maybe cross-validate your results or whatsoever, um, then this will be possible in the future as well. And um, that is um, the basic idea, one tool um, that can do it all. If it's a regression analysis, effector analysis, PLS SEM or uh, CB SEM, and uh, thereby um, giving you um, the access uh, to these methods. And that's basically what will be happening in the next 12 months. And um, on these solid grounds of um, uh, a software application, which definitely um, focuses um, its developments in the future with Smart PLS 4, we make sure that um, it will exist in 10 years or thereafter. Um, we will give you um, the grounds and um, the tools at hand uh, to conduct your research um, with a strong future orientation. So I guess that we all are looking forward for the updates from Smart PLS, right? A lot of new things is coming up. Things are getting more interesting. 
So that's um, really, really, really fun. That's really, really Becky, fun. Just one, one side note, if you allow me. Um, I can hear the questions. When will it be released? <laughs> be patient. <laughs> yeah, be patient. <laughs> This is uh, German software engineering, and um, it means um, that once you develop an algorithm, um, you get the algorithm into the software and it's running, you get results. But then um, more than 10 times um, of the time is related to testing, applicability, and all these stages. And to make sure that you release something that is 100% uh, perfect or almost 100% perfect, takes a lot of testing, many, many hours and so on. So um, that is um, why we cannot definitely announce a release date um, for now, but um, we are aiming at uh, something next year, but uh, I cannot, I will not uh, uh, raise too much expectations at that stage. It's running, it's working, we are testing already, but uh, yeah, expectation management is important here. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. So. Next interesting question is to Professor Marco. Apart from attending physical workshop, what would be your advice for researchers like me and students to learn PLS SEM continually in this current environment, especially everyone is facing this pandemic of COVID-19? So the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, actually physical workshops as you indicated are a bit uh, complicated at the moment. Um, so, but there are uh, plenty of ways how to uh, learn um, the fundamentals of PLS and there are also plenty of ways how to delve into the more advanced topics. So if you're like a total novice in the area and you have now listened to this and maybe understood half of it, uh, it's already for somebody who has never um, worked with PLS, that would be already pretty good. Huh? Uh, but don't be concerned, there are lots of um, uh, sources that you can draw upon, really, which guide you through your first PLS analysis step by step. And I'm really saying that uh, step by step in this first analysis, because I think you got to be also realistic in what you can do. We often get, like Chris and I, we often get requests by PhD students say, yeah, I want to run like a higher order construct with mediated moderation and consider unobserved heterogeneity. How do I do that? And then you learn that this person has never really used uh, uh, or specified even a very simplistic model. Yeah, So be realistic about that. A good way to start is a uh, certain look into the books. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you've already seen uh, our books uh, with uh, Professor Hare that we wrote, uh, Primer on PLS SEM. There's also another version by uh, it's excellent book also by um, Professor Amaya, Jackie, Francis, uh, Hiram and uh, Mumtas. It's also excellent. Yeah, you can also look into this one. Uh, guide you through the process step by step, like our how-to article in European Business Review, but it's not using like screenshots and so on, so you have to figure out the software yourself. Um, another uh, means of doing that are um, various uh, YouTube videos that you see, uh, let, not meaning to be critical, but some are better than others. Um, some are really well done, but others are actually factually wrong. <laughs> so there are actually sometimes really errors in there. Um, but I mean, uh, so I'm not going to point point to anyone, but uh, you've got to be a bit careful there and at least validate it by looking into the books and articles. Uh, one thing I can only um, recommend, obviously, is our PLS SEM Academy. We responded to the various queries to uh, give online classes at some point because, I mean, we, Chris and I, we are running our own institute. We are family and um, so we can't hold workshops like all over the world all the time so we decided to do some professional recording really in a studio with professional cutting and quality control by fellow researchers and you can uh, just log into the PLS SEM Academy check out the course program um, there's some free videos on there but obviously we also need to finance the professional recording so uh, it, it costs but I think personally I think it's still a bargain considering what you would pay uh, for other professional courses. And we decided uh, for all uh, um, participants in the seminar to um, grant you like a discount code, which you can see here on the slide, 15% discount, uh, which can you can use, I think in the next um, four weeks. I can't recall how long it's actually valid, but if there's a problem, just get back to us. Yeah, so use this discount code and, at checkout. Um, obviously, 
recent journal article something to consider. Uh, there are the more technical ones, which might uh, look a bit too complicated, but typically what we try to do is like with CVPAT, you saw the decision science paper that Kristen showed in this slide. What we typically do, we try to write like the, the foundations in a more statistical manner, but also to come up with like a how-to article, which really shows how to do this yeah, for the novice researcher. So we try to cater to, to both groups, the methods uh, savvy researchers interested in the statistics, and those uh, that are just using it. Yeah, for, for you, it's just a means to the end of getting results. We understand that. Yeah, And for that reason, uh, we try to uh, write more like how-to articles. Yeah. Um, other than that, just finally, trial and error. What I typically do when I work, for example, with our packages, I sit down with uh, my assistant professor. We run a hackathon, meaning we just sit down uh, an evening, order some pizza or so, and just work our way through there. Make all the errors ourselves, fail all the time, and at some point we find the, the right program or you know, the right line of code and figure it out. Yeah, so lots of it is just also trial and error. It's time consuming, that's right, but um, that's part of the process, I think. Thanks. Next. Yeah, uh, before we next, uh, I'm glad to know that every one of us could have an alternative platform to learn PLS right now, since uh, Professor Marco have mentioned, uh, can go through several articles, journals, book, PLS Academy. So plus, don't forget, uh, this include the 50% discount given by the PLS Academy. If you really want to learn stuff, remember the 15% discount. Uh, don't worry, the slide will be given later. So there's uh, this code for you to use for this PLS Academy, and this is a very great opportunity. So last but not least, uh, this will be an interesting question to all of us, and I will direct this question to Prof Ramaya. Many students seem to use smart PLS and various techniques without having a clear understanding on uh, the software and the techniques. Could you point out some common mistakes and provide recommendation for future use? So Prof, the floor is yours. <laughs> 